Barney and Courtney, bless them, went over last night after dinner to where the spillway is, which is a 24-inch vertical pipe to carry off the overflow. It was clogged. And they unclogged it, waited out and got it unclogged. And this morning, the lake has gone down two feet. <laughs> <laughs> There's all sorts of mud and debris strewn down the road, rocks and stuff, where the road wash, where the creek washes over the road. There's quite a lot of water down there last yeah. night. Oh, yeah. That's, well, we've always known down there that there are three or four places that if you're up here in a heavy rain, uh, of course, we've had a drought this last year, but if you're up here in a heavy rain, you better get out if you're going out, because uh, I know Barney and I waited one day down there, so before I was in this job, we waited down at that one nearest the highway for an hour until a big truck happened to come along, and we had a line, and he gave us a tow through. We had a Mercury when I was driving, and the water came even under the doors on the floor of the car one through there. Okay. This is a test of the audio circuit from the Reagan Ranch in California. President Reagan's radio address will begin in five minutes from my mark. Counting down, 10, 9, 8, 10, 9, 8, Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, mark. Fifteen seconds, Mr. President. Ten seconds. Five seconds. My fellow Americans, today I'd like to speak to you of a gathering crisis in our society. It's a family crisis. To some, it's hidden, concealed behind tenement walls, or lost in the forgotten streets of our inner cities. But for millions of Americans, the crisis is ever-present and growing, and it threatens to become a permanent scar on the American promise of hope and opportunity for all. I'm talking about the crisis of family breakdown, especially among the welfare poor, both black and white. In inner cities today, families, as we've always thought of them, are not even being formed. Since 1960, the percentage of babies born out of wedlock has more than doubled, and too often, their mothers are only teenagers. Their children, many of them 15, 16, and 17 years old, with all the responsibilities of grown-ups thrust upon them. The fathers of these children are often nowhere to be found. In some instances, you have to go back three generations before you can find an intact family. It seems even the memory of families is in danger of becoming extinct. And what are the babies born out of wedlock, these children born to children? Statistically, we know that they're much more likely to have a low birth weight and thus serious health problems. We know that out of wedlock children often suffer abuse and neglect as well. And what sort of future can they look forward to? The family is the most basic support system there is. For two centuries now, it's been families pulling together that has provided the courage, willpower, and sense of security that have enabled millions of Americans to escape poverty and grab hold of the rungs on the ladder of opportunity. How often have we heard about the immigrant father laboring long into the night to give his children the advantages he never had? How many self-made men and women in America, of all ethnic backgrounds, owe their success to the strength of character given them by hard-working, loving parents? But for the children of child mothers and absentee fathers, there is often only a deepening cycle of futility, hopelessness, and despair. We're in danger of creating a permanent culture of poverty as inescapable as any chain or bond, a second and separate America, an America of lost dreams and stunted lives. The irony is that misguided welfare programs instituted in the name of compassion have actually helped turn a shrinking problem into a national tragedy. From the 1950s on, poverty in America was declining. American society, an opportunity society, was doing its wonders. Economic growth was providing a ladder for millions to climb up out of poverty and into prosperity. 
In 1964, the famous War on Poverty was declared, and a funny thing happened. Poverty, as measured by dependency, stopped shrinking and then actually began to grow worse. I guess you could say poverty won the war. Poverty won in part because instead of helping the poor, government programs ruptured the bonds holding poor families together. Perhaps the most insidious effect of welfare is its usurpation of the role of provider. In states where payments are highest, for instance, public assistance for a single mother can amount to much more than the usable income of a minimum wage job. In other words, it can pay for her to quit work. Many families are eligible for substantially higher benefits when the father is not present. What must it do to a man to know that his own children will be better off if he is never legally recognized as their father? Under existing welfare rules, a teenage girl who becomes pregnant can make herself eligible for welfare benefits that will set her up in an apartment of her own, provide medical care and feed and clothe her. She only has to fulfill one condition, not marry or identify the father. Obviously, something is desperately wrong with our welfare system. With only about half of what is now spent on welfare, we could give enough money to every impoverished man, woman, and child to lift them above the poverty line. Instead, we spend vast amounts on a system that perpetuates poverty. But the waste of money pales before the sinful waste of human potential, the squandering of so many millions of hopes and dreams. In my State of the Union address, I directed our administration to study the welfare system with a keen eye to making reforms. We already have in place a low-income assistance working group, which is hard at its task. In addition, I have instructed Attorney General Edwin Meese, as Chairman Pro Tem of our Domestic Policy Council, to convene a working group to evaluate the effect of a wide range of government programs on American families, especially poor families. These groups will report back to me by December 1st. The welfare tragedy has gone on too long. It's time to reshape our welfare system so that it can be judged by how many Americans it makes independent of welfare. Until next week, thanks for listening. God bless you. Thank you, sir. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Uh, so lucky. Come on. Come on. Seated on the front seat. Okay. Got a girl. Do you also do one of these zooming on the front seat? Just a little worried about the fog. Uh, I'm going to get in front of them. Get in front of them. Okay. Get out of there. Come here. Come here. Come here. Come here. Come here. This lift it up a little bit. Can we use this on the next trip? Huh? You can use this on the next trip? <laughs> Don't put fancy boxes up the back. Now we're really going to. He's going to raise this. Oh, they're just having a meeting then. Oh.
Thank you, sir. Right. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, you got a great tractor. Yeah. Where did the old one go? The old one's gone. Oh, it's gone already. Went down the hill. <laughs> it was already part way. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> Here, I'll take that, Barney. Barney, I'll take I'll take the jacket. I'm going back down. Can you uh, come to my room and sign a few pictures? Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Are you gonna send one of these to Mr. Gaddafi? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Remember the tractor CD? Yes. yes. I couldn't tell what kind he had. Uh -oh. Oh, this is a short uh -oh. scene. Uh -oh. This is really everything. Uh oh. Just <laughs> <Not> everything. <laughs> You just made it. Really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh-oh, there's... No, down. No. 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 Oh, Sit. I don't know Sit. Ah, okay, shake. Yeah. No, with one hand. <laughs> you. <laughs> Furry monster. <laughs> there, I got you. What we said it was. Dog heaven. Dog heaven. I love it. Oh, really? Right. So he wants to go around the bottom, take the side of each one, or if you go 